and anyone who might be viewing outside on the YouTube live stream to the rise and fall of complex societies. I keep saying fall, um, the rise and collapse of complex societies. Uh, and today we'll be having a presentation on the Persian Empire, one of the great and largest empires to ever exist. Uh, and understand perhaps a little more after this presentation what precipitated their their ability to be defeated so handily by Alexander the Great. How much of it was the Persian fault and how much was just the exceptional character of, of Alexander the Great. But to, to be able to assess that, we need to understand what was going on in the Persian Empire. Uh, before we get started, I just want to talk a little bit about the concept of collapse in, in the context of our modern society and some of the theory and some of the examples we were looking at in ancient societies. What do you, come to the class here, what do you see about what's going on today? What elements of collapse from a theoretical perspective and a practical perspective do you see going on? Or, and, what is your feeling about the future that the direction of the United States is, the United States, not the United States, the world is moving, but it could be different elements of the world as well. Um, so particularly the United States, of course, is, is um, in, um, enmeshed in racial protests. What do you think about the world? What, what do you think are the symptoms of collapse that we're looking at? And what are we doing about it or not doing about it that may lead us to collapse or to, to not collapse? And, and I just wanna hear your thoughts on it. We've been talking about, you know, civilizations falling apart for a while here um, and, and often referencing back to the modern era that we're in. Um, you know, if we taught this class 10 years ago, it, it would have been very different. We would have stuck a lot more with the historical concepts, but the failure to react to global warming and climate change, the racial tensions, the economic disparities, um, the increased military tensions in certain areas, um, the move towards totalitarian and fascist regimes, which always tend to be more warlike and, and prone to uh, aggression, um, I think have to give us pause about looking today at, the, at what's going on today in that historical perspective. So let me ask you guys, just what are your thoughts on, on what's going on out here? Yeah, I'll see. Yeah, maybe right now we have difficulties, I mean, the whole world and countries to solve the problems that we face. Uh, just because uh, yeah, I think that Diamond discussed that in his book, so there is a short-term benefit and long-term benefit. And so right now there is a competition or, over res resources and everybody can understand that um, we should not reduce trees anymore or so on in some countries i mean but still it is important for production for economics and that is why we cannot like um yeah start uh, yeah in, and here is the question is what is the rational behavior like to to stop doing that or to continue yeah i, I mean our we like to think of ourselves as rational creatures, but are we? Is it 50-50, we're half rational? Rational when it's convenient, or? Rational if we taught to be. If we taught are taught to be? Yep. Expound on that a little bit, Andre, because I think that's a really important thought. I guess rational thought is a product of our study, of our experience, and sometimes we can develop it ourselves, but I guess studying can help. Yeah, 
I, I mean, if you look at our evolution, obviously we evolved acting instinctually and, and acting like any other animal. And yet we've superimposed on top of this, this layer of culture of standards to behave that allow us to operate in, in a much grander scale with much more complexity, with much more anticipation for consequences uh, through repetitive learning where we record history and, and philosophy and science for thousands of years. And, and we teach ourselves to overcome some of our instincts because we have all that biological instinct in us right you know instincts towards sex and violence and laziness and you know uh, gluttony and and all these things that we have these biological we're hardwired for those things and yet we we also understand that we need to not succumb to those things right this, this goes obviously into a lot of, of, of religion and, and philosophy uh, to, to get stay away from those vices that because we know that if we want to build a better world if we want a better society if we want to protect the future that we have to find the, that higher level of thinking of, of rational thought that, that suppresses some aspects of our, our you know more animalistic you know biological um, evolutionary um, antecedents So Daria, did, did, did I, no, <laughs> uh, you should turn on your videos if you can, because I can see your faces. And that's always, I can see your animated faces, which is always better than just a letter or a picture. So if we're gonna succeed as a society, as a civilization, we can't we can't really go on the way we've gone on, can we? We have to change it because obviously we're, we're failing. And it, you know, I was thinking about the movement. They have this this movement in America called defund the police, um, which is probably a bad name because it makes it sound like you want to eliminate the police, you know, take away their budget. But the idea is to transform the police into. Um, a large uh, into a more integrated part of the community rather than having them operating apart from the community. So, so that you take some of the budget that the police currently have and you put it into housing, into welfare, into social work, into suicide prevention, into drug addiction, into all these other things that, that build a stronger society. And then you need less police because if you address those things head on, um, you create a more holistic approach to making the, the human condition better within a city. And so there's this, this ideology, this movement that's going on to transform the way police work is done in America. Uh, when, I, when I was a cop, it was, that was more my philosophy. You know, I was there to, to make life better for people um, and to protect them, obviously. But, uh, you know, it seems like there has been a trend over the last, since I was a cop and I left police work in 1991 uh, or 92, that there's been a trend towards more militarism and, uh, with the police where they have better armaments. Um, and, and there seemed to be a growing divide. There was more white supremacists trying to infiltrate into the police departments. Uh, and so you, you've had this transformation going away from the idea of being an integral part of the community towards more being a means of suppressing the community. And I think that's, you're seeing this, this backlash now in America, and it seems strong enough that maybe, maybe there will be some real significant social change in the structuring of American police work. That's how you cure some of the problems that can lead to a collapse of society. So these, these become transitional points. Now, if the, if the government reacts with overwhelming force, tries to suppress you, know, as, as the Chinese did, you'll see the government slip more towards a, a totalitarian regime, you know, after Tiananmen Square or with, with Hong Kong, um, and, and you will lose that opportunity. Um, but America has that opportunity now and how the government responds and how, how people respond, how persistent and how motivated people are to make a real change in society uh, is, is going to be a, a measure of what America will be in the future. And if it is going to at least 
a bridge and cut off this one route towards a stressor that can lead to collapse. Uh, any word from Alyssa? Um, maybe you have your email address so we can write you there. Yeah, let me see. We can start without her, but it won't be fair. Um, yeah, fair to you. Let me send her a Zoom invite also. Uh, when did you last talk to her? This morning. Good morning. And she was all okay then? Yeah. Uh, are you able to start without her and then she can hopefully join in? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to. Um, what what part is she covering? Economy station. Okay. Uh, you disable the share screen. Screen share. Uh, I need to change those defaults. All right, well, let's hope that uh, Alyssa joins us here soon. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let me turn things over to our Persian study group. Hello, can you see the slides? Yes. Uh, great. My name is Tanya and my colleagues are Daria, Anya, Andre, and Alisa. Uh, we're gonna present a community empire. Uh, why a community empire not a Persian empire? Because the community empire was the second Persian empire with the most famous collapse in which Alexander the Great was one of the main actors. Um, but before I start to tell, we start to tell you about uh, a community empire and its collapse. Uh, I want you to know some basic facts uh, uh, about the community empire. Uh, it was the first uh, uh, country that established the coinage system. Uh, moreover, the community Persian empire was the first to remain equal and religiously tolerant empire and consisted of a multitude of different languages, races, religions, and cultures. It was the largest empire the ancient world had known, stretching three continents and 25 nations. It made possible the first significant and continuous conflict between East and West. The Persian Empire was also the first system of federal governments in the world. Uh, 
and um, uh, it made a respect for local traditions, laws, languages, and religions uh, set the foundation of relatively benevolent empire. Uh, the period of the Economic Empire from the beginning of the Economic State uh, to the conquest of Alexander the Great was an extremely important stage uh, in the history of ancient Iran. During these two and a half centuries, the foundations for the first political and cultural development of Iranian society were laid. During this time, the Khamenei state became a world power and began to play an important role in the entire Middle East. Being well developed during its Achaemenid period, um, the empire owed a lot to its kings. The conquest of Cyrus the Great and Cambyses with the wise reign of Darius I were the crucial point in the maintenance of the Achaemenid Empire's vitality and superiority over other existing empires uh, in the ancient world. And some of the aspects we should take into account considering the greatness of the Achaemenid Empire are its geographical location, of course, connections between trade centers and the rational management of water sources, um, as well as agriculture. And I will mention them a bit later. But at first, I want to tell you uh, the political geography. The state was divided into 20 satrapies, or someone claimed that were uh, 30, uh, which were governed by, sat by satraps. Uh, uh, who was, uh, uh, satraps were usually uh, royal family members, and uh, they were set by a king, and uh, they uh, depended on him. He, uh, the satrap had his own court and secretaries. Each year, uh, he must have come to the court to give a report. Uh, and satrap duties included the management of satrapal administration, collection of taxes, overseeing the satrap's encumbrance and trade, and mastering military forces if and when required. In detail, each state had absolutely internal autonomy to do as they pleased in their own internal affairs. All states had control over their affairs. The educational system, local languages, and even their own military forces. The only thing that first of all is required, uh, it is the capital of the Dominican Empire, uh, was absolute obedience to central government on international, political, and military affairs. Uh, next, I'm gonna go. On a, I'm gonna tell you about people. Uh, the king was the God's uh, representative on earth, and he was also the head of the political judi uh, judis, uh, judicial uh, and military power. <laughs> Um, around him was uh, the court uh, that uh, consisted of uh, king's closest people. They were uh, king's advisors, and uh, in this court, uh, women also could participate. Moreover, women in the Communist Empire were quite independent, uh, since uh, king's wife could have her own business uh, outside the capital, uh, and he, she could visit uh, her house in, in her land. And in this house, she managed her people, hired other one, and was a business lady in all terms of uh, modern language. Uh, but usual people were uh, all subjects uh, of king. And uh, regardless of social status, uh, uh, they were servants, and people were distinguished by their ethnicity, which usually was inseparable from location. That is why uh, we can say that there was social ethnic identifications. Moreover, uh, since the uh, Khamenei Empire was tolerant to traditions, they kept their own traditions. Uh, so religion. Uh, before we start to, to talking about um, about um, Empire, a little introduction into Zoroastrianism. 
It is one of the world's oldest monotheistic religion. It's still practiced today as a minority religion in parts of Iran and the India. Recent estimates uh, place the current number of the Zoroastrians uh, at around two and six million people. Uh, it ascribed to the teaching of the Iranian prophet Zoroaster or Zaratustra and exalted the deity of wisdom, Ahura Mazda, which can be also translated as a wise lord. And it is their supreme being. Leading characteristics such as messianism, heaven, and hell, and free will are said to have influenced other religious systems, including Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, in Zoroastrianism, water and fire are agents of uh, ritual purity, and the sated uh, purification ceremonies are considered as the basis of ritual life. The religion states that active participation in life or through good deeds is necessary to ensure happiness and to keep chaos at bay. This active participation is a central element in the Rastra concept of free will, and the Chinese reject all form of monast monasticism. And next slide, please. No, 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 slide back. Mm, okay, so the uh, Hemenid kings were devoted to the Rastrians. Uh, by most accounts, Cyrus the Great was a tolerant ruler who allowed his subject uh, to speak their own language and practice their own religion. Uh, while he ruled um, by the Zoroastrian law, um, truth and righteousness, he didn't impose uh, Zoroastrianism on the people of Persia, Persia's conquered territories. Uh, also, Hebrew in scriptures uh, praised Cyrus the Great for freeing the Jewish people of ba Babylon from captivity and allowing them to return to Jerusalem. Uh, subsequent ru rulers in the Achaemenid Empire followed Cyrus the Great hands of approach to social and religious affair, allowing Persians uh, diverse uh, citizens to continue to practice their own ways of life. Uh, this period of time is sometimes called uh, the Pax Persia or Persian peace. So that's all, next slide. This said the state was divided into regions of gold satrapies governed by members of royal family. And, uh, but the land wasn't populated equally. There were many rural settlements and most people did not live uh, in cities. Moreover, satrapies were almost autonomous in cities, so all problems accept information of relationships. Daria, you're muted. I'm sorry. Such a vast territory required a strong communication, especially for trade. And infrastructure mainly consisted of a network of roads and canals. And road travel seems to have played a more prominent role than maritime traffic. It is known that Darius was responsible for improving sea routes by building a channel connecting the Red Sea with the Nile Delta. However, the most important ph phenomenon of that time was the construction of the network of roads uh, called the Royal Roads, the most famous of which connected with Persepolis and Susa. And the distances were measured in parasangs. Each of them was equal to five or six kilometers. And at intervals of 25 to 30 kilometers, there were road stations with food and shelter. Next slide, please. No, back, go back, yeah. Besides, no, next, yes. 
besides not only were the central um, cities connected with this royal road, but also there were connections with the capitals and provinces, which allowed to uh, transport crops and goods to the farthest reaches of the empire. And this um, itinerary served not only as the trade route, but also had a strategic importance in, in the conquests and expeditions. They allowed the movement of groups and even royal court from one part to another of the imperial territories. Although travel in antiquity was slow, inefficient, um, costly, still it is demonstrated in the, the movements of people and goods within the empire to its remotest reaches. The greatest rivers, including Tigris and Euphrates, were spanned by bridges. And since the water level varied considerably from season to season, in some regions it was preferable to build pontoon bridges. Next slide, please. The annual levels of rainfall um, were different in different regions, and most of them, uh, most of the regions did not depend on irrigation system. For example, in the north and west parts of um, empire, enough rains fall, fell to grow crops without the need for regular irrigation. But in Egypt and Mesopotamia, for example, the irrigation was necessary. It was totally dependent on irrigation. Um, yeah, and irrigation systems, as we can see, were an important part of empire's functioning. Um, there were two irrigation, two main irrigation works in the Persepolis Plain, um, which names you can see on the slide. Um, and uh, the first one controlled the small stream of water springs, but the structure of the, the second one allowed to establish an economically viable irrigation system. Its size was astonishing. It was a massive stone, uh, 82 meters long and 6.5 meters wide. And it was really high, uh, about three meters. There were five openings through the structure and recently the six, sixth um, opening was, was reconstructed. Um, and apparently such complex systems um, maintained the productions um, pr production of crops and flourishment of agriculture. Um, they demanded a lot of effort to be undertaken and um, maybe there were even plans and drawings of such systems. Next slide, please. Um, on this slide you can see the, the example of one. I'm sorry. sorry yes, uh, as Natalia system. said, the irrigation was really important for the Humanity Empire. And now I want to see one of the most popular system. It's called Kanat. Uh, it's an ancient time of uh, water supply system developed and still used in some region of the world. Uh, Kanat taps uh, underground mountain water sources trapped in the beneath the upper reach for alluvial funds and channels the water downhill through a series of gently sloping tunnels over several kilometers long uh, to the place where it's needed for irrigation and also for domestic use. Uh, the development of the nuts probably began about uh, 2000 and uh, half or 3000 years ago in Iran. And the technology spread eastward to Afghanistan and westward to Egypt. And as I said, this, this system is used even today. So next slide, please. The Persian Empire had a developed agriculture and the territory included all types of terrain, which allowed to grow completely different types of crops. But the most important for human consumption throughout the region were wheat and barley. Also, um, Persians mm -hmm. uh, growed uh, wheat and clover for large cattle and drought animals, um, which were really essential for agriculture because they were used like a transport uh, to, uh, to, to, for the armies. Um, and it seems like that in context of geography and developed road systems and agriculture, the Achaemenid Empire did not have weak points, but still one of the possible reasons that eventually led to collapse was um, the famine, uh, the, the agricultural crisis in, um, in, in, in the middle of um, the Achaemenid period, where this year's 
um, saw a severe drought and the first harvest failure occurred maybe in the first year of campuses, who was one of the um, kings of the Persian Empire. And the consequences of this drought and famine were devastating. But yeah, the lack of harvest led to a famine throughout the Babylonia. And only by the fourth year of this um, the famine drought, the pressure was relieved somehow. And there is no exact um, reason of the famine, but maybe drought is one of the most reasonable. Next slide. And of course, to keep the empire together and to conquer land, you need a good and efficient army. Um, they had a very effective uh, battle doctrine in the early ages. Uh, it was based on a, using combined uh, arms tactics uh, of uh, archers, in infantry, and cavalry. The archers, uh, usually placed in the center of the army, would uh, attack first, discharging uh, their arrows, followed by um, uh, slingers who would release uh, stones and pieces of metal at the enemy. This would um, disrupt the enemy lines, which would allow uh, the cavalry to strike first, uh, strike fast, and uh, usually that was enough to devastate the enemy army. And at the end, the last one to engage would be um, in infantry armed with the short swords and the spears. And they usually uh, only ne needed to finish off whatever was left of the enemy combatants. Uh, these tactics were really successful uh, during the early conquest of uh, Babylon, of Lydia, and uh, in Egypt, mostly because uh, this uh, rapid and decisive nature of these tactics um, could not be uh, they they had had no uh, uh, good uh, uh, the enemy usually don't, didn't have any good response to such a f fast attack but uh, it would uh, this also led to uh, uh, some, some historians believe this uh, this uh, easy kind of uh, victories led to f false sense of military superiority, and this belief would be later shattered in uh, future wars in Greece. Next slide, please. Uh, among other things, uh, the army had an elite troops, uh, the so-called immortals, which uh, had a constant number of 10,000 troops, which means that uh, the place of a fallen soldier or a sick one who left the army for some reasons would be immediately replaced by a new one. They uh, served as a both royal guard who would always accompany the king and the guard in army who uh, would always surround the king would he want to participate in a battle himself that's all for me next slide yeah taxation system uh, so uh, the taxation system was really important for the empire because the basic principle of the royal economy was uh, was that the expenditures shouldn't uh, exceed the in income. The sources of revenue were primarily regular taxes, custom duties, and gift giving. Uh, state taxes existed already in the time of Cyrus, but under Cyrus and Cambyses, there were not yet a stricter regulated system of taxes since people who didn't pay taxes had to deliver gift and in another way. Uh, however, Darius uh, make a taxation system reform 
So he introduced a new monetary system, which consisted of silver coins. Next slide, please. Uh, weighting eight grams and gold coins weighting five and four grams, uh, which corresponded to 20 silver coins. As these gold coins were called barracks. However, it is important to mention that most of the subject nations minted their own coins and used their own monetary system uh, side by side with the system uh, introduced by Darius. Uh, this uh, new modified administration also helped uh, to empower to enhance trade and offer safe trade routes to the subject people by building new roads and improving the new road networks. Yeah, that's all. And art and architecture. As their ancient version uh, of the Achaemenid Empire created art in many forms, including metalwork, rock carvings, weaving, and architecture. Uh, as the Persian Empire expanded and the encompass other arti artistic center of early civilization, a new style was formed with influences from these sources. Uh, early Persian art included large carved rock reliefs cut into cliffs, uh, such as those we can see at the portal, at the photos uh, found at Nashke Rustam and ancient cemetery, uh, for example, of um, Darius the Great, uh, and uh, other cemetery filled with the tombs of Achaemenid kings. Uh, the elaborate rock murals depict uh, uh, different scenes uh, and mostly about uh, battle victories. Next slide, please. And this is also the tomb of Cyrus the Great. And next slide. Uh, ancient Persia uh, were also known for their metalwork. Hmm. These uh, artifacts that we can see in the photos included a small golden uh, coins, bracelet, and necklace, also vases with uh, motifs of griffons and lions. And next slide. Uh, the history of carpet weaving in Persia dates back to the nomadic tribe. The ancient Greeks prized the artistry of these hand woven rugs, famous for their elaborate design and bright colors. Next slide. Uh, this is the Persepolis, the ancient Persian capital city, and uh, maybe the most famous. Uh, from uh, ancient Iran. It's a city, it was in the southern uh, part of Achaemenid Empire, ranks among the world's uh, greatest archaeological cities. Uh, it was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site in uh, 1979. The Achaemenid, this palace of Persepolis were built upon massive uh, terraces. They were decorated with ornamental Facades that included the long crock relief, carving for which the uh, with carving uh, for which uh, and this carving were already famous with the, in uh, Achaemenid Empire time. Next slide. Well, okay, we came to a conclusion that Achaemenid Empire was weakened by internal strife and the attacks of Alexander the Great became the critical point which led to the fall of the empire. Things began to get worse with the reign of Xerxes I and deteriorated with each new ruler. And the next years were characterized as a period of stagnation and decline. There were revolts by members of royal family and rulers. Egypt surrendered to the Achaemenid control. Military power was not preserved um, as the Achaemenid emperors became fatally dependent on mercenary forces, religious freedom was replaced by religious intolerance, and the bureaucracy became corrupt, card life degenerated, taxes were suppressed. In short, by the fourth century, the empire was declining. The once powerful Achaemenid army, weakened by the wars, succumbed to the conquests of the Alexander the Great, and the pervasive image of the Achaemenid history 
once, represent, once represented by the creative innovation and vigorous activity with its strong leaders had changed a lot and the empire was not able to escape its collapse anymore. All right, so the Greek and Persians uh, wars uh, was a, a series of military conflicts in a 499 to 449 BC, which consisted of two invasions in uh, during the Darius the Great rule and during the he, the rule of his son Xerxes. It all began uh, because uh, uh, after the conquest of uh, the land of Ion which were mostly populated by Greek, Greeks, um, they uh, couldn't quite uh, integrate this land into the empire because of the nature of a Greek. Since um, uh, this Greek people uh, usually would be ruled by uh, tyrants who are usually uh, really strong uh, ru rulers, but uh, instead in Ion, uh, Persia would uh, only um, give them a appointed man who would not be as as good as a typical uh, Greek tyrant, which led to Ionian revolt, uh, which was later. Uh, Blame, blamed, uh, which later uh, the Persian blamed uh, Greek Greece for it. Next slide, please. The first invasion of Greece is notable for uh, two things. Uh, one is the transportation of uh, Greek army through uh, through the water. And uh, the second one is that uh, Persian army, you, the usual uh, battle strategy, proved very inefficient against uh, Greece, Greek troops. Because of, uh, firstly, because of uh, their um, uh, priority, priority uh, because of the archers. Uh, since uh, uh, what uh, per Persians uh, did not expect was that Greeks had heavy armor and shields uh, big enough that, so if they interlock them above them, their hand, uh, head, they could uh, close themselves uh, from errors completely, which uh, led to archers being almost completely useless. And since uh, Again, since uh, they did not uh, had uh, strong close combat troops, because usually, as I was saying before, they usually only was used uh, for finishing off the remains of the army. But since there were no remains, but strong and uh, heavy equipped uh, troops, they again uh, were really inefficient. And that led to the really uh, amazing numbers uh, of um, around 6,000 uh, persons killed and only on about 200 Greeks uh, died during this battle. Next slide, please. Uh, since the first invasion of Greece uh, uh, was a failure, Still, uh, the son of Darius the Great, uh, King Xerxes, uh, wanted to uh, saw the, the Greeks as the greatest enemy and wanted to, I, I guess, prove himself. Or uh, may, maybe it was a part of the unfinished business uh, of his father. So uh, to Achaemenid eyes, uh, the Greeks uh, defied the authority of the king and had to be put down. Uh, the, Greek, uh, the Greeks uh, 
again managed to fight them off because uh, for some reasons uh, Persians didn't take any lessons from the pre previous almost didn't take any lessons from previous war and uh, had to had to uh, just uh, push them by overwhelming force uh, and the Second invasion uh, is famous because of the also Spartan king Leonidas and his 300 Spartans who decided to uh, meet the Persians at the narrow pass of the mountains called Thermopylae and to uh, hold them off uh, be before Persians could find a way around the mountains. Next slide, please. Uh, when uh, Greek, uh, Persians finally reached the Athens, they uh, found out that uh, uh, the city was empty. And uh, in, in, instead, they found that uh, the um, most of the wealth was uh, taken away and it was protected by uh, Athenian fleet. Uh, Xerxes uh, was ad advised against uh, fighting the uh, Greeks' uh, naval forces because they had uh, much faster uh, and maneuverable ships, uh, triremes, and uh, they, uh, in a battle, they managed to ram into the sides of uh, uh, much larger Persian ships and sunk them uh, and also uh, since uh, Greeks proven themselves to be much better in a close combat they also uh, could uh, fire, uh, land on the ships of the Persians and take them over by force just uh, killing the crew next slide please Um, as a result, Persia lost its uh, pos 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 oh, my God. possessions in the, in the Asian uh, Sea on the coast of the Hellespont and the Bosphorus and recognized the political independence of the polis of Asia Minor. Um, they uh, finally recognized, uh, however, their um, inability in a close combat which led to them hiring uh, Greek mercenaries later on to compensate uh, their inability to fight in a close combat. Um, they, uh, but um, still uh, they uh, had a number of uh, serious military weaknesses they couldn't really address as uh, for example they couldn't really uh, uh, so to say think outside the box to uh, make a smart uh, strategical maneuvers and they uh, didn't really have uh, well-established lines of uh, logistics uh, which also didn't have much uh, help. Also, uh, personal military was international. Uh, it was consisted of many uh, ethnosis and they didn't always spoke the same language, which also led to inability to command them effectively. That's all for me for now. Next slide. So when you look at Xerxes' reign, um, we said earlier that the <clears throat> Persians were quite tolerant over like the different um, religions and traditions of their different satrapies in the different countries they owned to. But there was like, um, when Xerxes came into reign, he made it like a slightly shift in that tolerance. And there is a note from Stoneman which says, among these countries, there was a place where previously false gods were worshipped. Afterwards, by the favor of 
Aura Master, I destroyed the sanctuaries of the demons, and I made proclamations. Demons shall not be worshipped where previously the demons were worshipped. They are worshipped Aura Master and Arta Chastis Reventli. So... Um, so here you can see that before, like that, for example, in uh, Egypt, they were not able to worship their their gods anymore. The worship of the gods was like um, punished and like, which was not, um, um, which was what happened under the different rulers, the different kings before. So here you can see a clear shift in the policy which weakened the cultural supremacy because like most of the, <clears throat> the satrapies and the, the countries belonging to the Achimid empire um, were like worshiping or were like glad that the persons were such, um, such tolerant rulers in terms of their traditions. And when um, normally the different, the other kings in Egypt were also announced a pharaoh. So they were the king of the Persian empire and at the same time a pharaoh in, uh, um, in Egypt. But um, Xerxes did not want to do that anymore and lost therefore also the respect of the people and he lost the respect of the customs and the religion in Egypt. Next slide. At the end of the reign of at the end of the reign of Darius, Egypt rebelled. Xerxes, two years after he acceded uh, to the throne, succeeded in uh, resubjecting the country of the Nile and uh, treated the Egyptians more harshly than his father. From now on, Persian's king doesn't want to consider himself the horror of the foreign, and uh, it's easy to respect the customs of religion of Egypt. And that is why uh, they lost control of Egypt and Babylonian uh, culture supremacy. However, after the defeats uh, in Greece, Xerxes devoted himself entirely to uh, affairs and he built uh, uh, construction in Persepolis and his own harem. And there is nothing more uh, concerning collapse uh, in, about Xerxes. Uh, I will speak about uh, Artaxis in the second. Um, when a civil war uh, broke out, uh, when he arrived, uh, the civil war broke out, which fortunately we know in detail from Xenophon's analysis. Uh, his brother, uh, Kiros, the younger brother, uh, uh, was unsuccessfully plotting to seize the throne. He ran Greece army, uh, which saw the rich state with poor politics. And uh, this might be the reason of collapse Greece uh, people remembered this bad condition of country. Moreover, at that in time, Egypt, uh, taking advantage of the situation, again comes out of the power of the Achaemenids. Egypt was strong enough to resist the Persians' attempts to reconquer the country and uh, remained under the rule of local dynasty. Moreover, the revolt of the satraps in Anatolia, or Great Satraps Revolt, break out of the control of the king of kings. 
factor of loyalty was based on economic benefits from the great king, and uh, that is why a participant uh, of um, uh, great satraps revolt alliance uh, uh, were ready to betray the allies and uh, they were ready to serve the king uh, if uh, he negotiated them and uh, in favorable terms So when you look at Artaxes III, um, he was considered <clears throat> a very capable and cruel ruler, ruler um, who ascended the throne in 359. Uh, he managed to subdue the Sartorps and get them under his control again. But um, um, he started issuing their, their coins again, but soon several cities in Phoenicia rebelled. Artaxas III began to prepare for a campaign in Egypt in 345 BC and subdued Phoenicia. Tim was taken and burned and its inhabitants were removed as slaves to Babylon and Susa. The way to Egypt was therefore open and the fighting that allowed involved Greek mercenaries in, on both sides. So it was more of a battle between mercenaries than the Persian-Egyptian confrontation. The lower Egypt was restored by Ahmed rule, but the local Egyptian dynasty continued to rule most of upper Egypt. So you had like a divided country in where uh, different politics were there at the same time. Um, when you look at how Artaxas' policy was like within the, the like how he, uh, he got to power or um, was that he uh, murdered a lot of people in the royal family um, because there was many fighting like who will become the king. So to secure his place, uh, he was just killing some family members or people who who he thought will try to take his power. And that was actually a, a common practice in that time. Next slide. Well, in Persian Empire, there was uh, two um, servants named Bagoy, or Bagoy. Um, but in our story, we will uh, tell uh, the story of uh, Bagoy the Elder. Uh, Bagoy was uh, an Eno uh, who later became a visitor to Artax Sarax uh, the Third. He helped succeeded in uh, once again making Egypt a province of the Achaemenids, um, probably in uh, 342. Uh, uh, and he suppressed uh, the rebels in Egypt and uh, sent Greek mercenaries to the king. Uh, while Bagus uh, administrated the satrapies and uh, gained uh, such power that he was uh, almost the real master of the empire towards the end of uh, the third time. He wanted more and more power, and that is why he poisoned uh, uh, Artaxerxes the third, uh, along with uh, most of his family. This became a reason uh, of unexpected rise of Artaxerxes the fourth. However, Bagoy wasn't happy with Artaxerx the Force or Arsis, and he wanted again more power for himself. And he encouraged uh, the son of the son of Artaxerx the Force, uh, named Darius, to 
kill his father. And uh, he thought he could control him, but uh, Darius was smarter and uh, he killed Bagoy after getting the power. So when Darius III came into power, he is the last ruler of the Achaemenid Empire. Um, you can see like with the whole the description we made before that the, the politics, the economy, the, the military activity was really, really vast and there were like a lot of revolts in different satrapies. So when he came to power, there was already an instability in, uh, um, within the empire. So um, there were satrapies who were jealous, who wanted like more privileges, who wanted different tax systems. And there was also Kabash in Egypt, uh, like we described before. And he uh, was kind of, he was different to his heirs. He had like not that much experience with like how to rule an empire. And um, when he, uh, when then Alexander started or decided he will try to gain control of the whole Persian Empire, Darius was not um, equipped for that. Like, uh, he was clearly not ready. Otherwise, Alexander the Great would never have won. Because when you look at the size of these two rulers, like what amount of land they actually owned and controlled. Um, Alexander with Macedonia and then the Greek he, uh, he invaded um, were really small and had a considerably smaller army. But they had some advantages because like when the, it, when the policy or the empire is in turmoil, you also don't have that much time, for example, for um, military expenses or um, for new technology. So when we look at the battle of Granicus, next slide. Wait, what? In 334, you can see uh, um, that one aspect was why the Alexander the Great one and not uh, Darius the Third was because they, um, but the military equipment that the ones had like, Alexander Great had like really long conal wood lances while the Persians only had very short lances which made them to uh, renew their military equipment two years later to try to defeat um, Alexander. Gregory? Yeah. Um, so at this point in time, um, there's also um, there are many, many factors as of oh, why Alexander was so, so successful and Darius wasn't. Uh, if we started in, in the beginning, uh, there were some uh, theories uh, that uh, in the beginning, when uh, the Alexander uh, landed in uh, uh, in uh, east, uh, and when the news of uh, Alexander in invasion reached uh, the Darius the Third's ears, he didn't take it seriously, and he thought, thought, thought for a moment that uh, satraps would manage to deal with it by themselves, which led to a somewhat late response. Of, uh, to the Alexander's threat. There's also um, a great motivation behind this, uh, this invasion since uh, for Alexander's forces, which pretty much remembered the uh, Persian Greek wars and uh, wasn't happy about these memories. <laughs> and um, they were really motivated to avenge and to uh, prove themselves to their ancestors, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, even when uh, and 
Darius, at, at some point, he offered a peace treaty for some lands and money. Uh, Alexander didn't take it because uh, he was willing to take this land because he believed uh, that these lands were a gift to him from the gods. Um, another thing is that uh, uh, Persians uh, had uh, also financial resources because uh, at this point again uh, the Persian Empire weren't really great economically because uh, of the constant revolts. Uh, constant revolts uh, re um, made, uh, were making a need for money because uh, there, there's a need for military to put down the, those revolts which uh, led to more harsh taxes, which in turn led to more revolts. This is uh, some kind of a, a cursed circle that empire found itself with. And uh, the econo uh, and economically, Alexander was uh, doing better. And uh, as he conquered more cities and their, their treasures, he was doing better and better and better. Uh, there's also the factor of um, morale on the side of uh, satrapies, or uh, when there's, there's some um, reports that uh, sometimes the oppressed people of land saw Alexander as a liberator and uh, uh, did not. Uh, did not resist that much. And so, uh, there's also, uh, all, uh, also and closer to, to the end of the war, uh, some cities uh, just gave up without a fight. It all ended with uh, and, uh, Darius III uh, was captured and killed by his own satrap, Belek. And this more or less put the end to the Achaemenids' uh, ruling right line. Next slide. So, to sum it all up, I mean, why can we even say that the invasion of Alexander III and him announcing himself as king of the empire is the fall of the Achaemenid Empire? Um, as we said before, that um, there wasn't much, there was a big tolerance over um, the religion and the traditions that the people did, but which slightly shifted with sexes, but then also got restored and was in most places acceptable. But there was a, like a big ideology around the king. So they promoted um, the image of the king, the the leadership and the supremacy of the king throughout the, the, the empire. So the major force which hold the empire together was the king and the people accepting him as king. So when, and the king was always from the Persian nobility. And when a foreigner, which was Alexander from Macedonia announced himself as king, we can say this was a shift in the rulership and when Alexander, even though he died very soon, but when he announced the different generals to the, to the different empire, we have like a shift in, for example, the Greekification, like this is the beginning of the Hellenistic uh, period. So um, there is a lot of, um, ideals from Greece got transferred more and more to the East. And even though most of the infrastructure that was constructed during the Achaemenid Empire still was in place. And to conclude this all, there are several factors within the economy, within the military, the technological advances, which um, on, 
obviously the policy which contribute to the fall of the empire. But um, we could say there was one decisive aspect and that was like for Alexander to decide to invade the whole Achaemenid empire. And yeah, that is about it. Excellent, thank you. Um, a really big topic, isn't it, Persia? Uh, and I, I thought you guys brought out some interesting points. You almost wonder if Alexander the Great hadn't conquered it, if it still might have broken apart and, and collapsed on, a, on its own weight at the rate things were going in the empire from what you were saying. Uh, let, let's open it up first to any questions. from our audience. Uh, I have a few questions then. Um, so for uh, Andre, at the Battle of, of Marathon, which is obviously one of the great classic battles of, of history and, and one that we still commemorate by running marathons, right? Running the, the, the route that the Greeks ran. Uh, but if I recall my, my history, that the, the Persian flanks were held by the Ionian troops, who, of course, were sympathetic in some ways in heritage um, to the Greeks, and that those, those flanks didn't perform very well. They, they, they fell back quickly, allowing the Persian army to be engulfed on the, on the sides by the Greeks. Is that, does that sound right to you? Yes, pretty much. So, so do you think that one of the weaknesses then was the use of these these Ionian troops against the Greeks, and when these Ionians were essentially Greeks? It was one of the many many factors that were at play. It was uh, once again, yes, the question of the morale of such troops because uh, the Greek they were fighting for uh, well, the, the land, their own home. It was uh, some, somewhat, I guess, a patriotic war at nature. And I guess that uh, unions uh, weren't were feeling really good about it. Attacking their homeland? Yeah. Uh, OK, yeah, interesting. So, so it, that is one of those structural weaknesses. And it's just kind of circumstantial of who they happen to be fighting and things, so uh, interesting. Um, on, um, uh, on, the, on the, for Anna, I think, the, the Zoroastrianism um, and this, this concept of staving off chaos, how do you think that that, that relates to the, the solidarity of the nation as, as a as a centripetal or, or centripetal force to to a nation state, um, staving off collapse. I mean, religion can be something that undermines authority or breaks down authority, or something that that can support political authority. What do you think the relationship was with Zoroastrianism and and Persian politics or recommended politics? I believe that uh, political authority was maintained not through like unite ideology in religion, but through exactly this um, tolerance policy. Uh, so, and what was the uh, other question about uh, this um, concept of uh, keep chaos at bay, chaos at bay? Yeah. I think it is also about, uh, not about, about, um, violence toward other nations uh, and uh, culture to make them, for them to change their religion, but to keep their, this chaos and leave the thing as it was. Uh, I mean, it, sometimes it seems like the, the, the state, you know, the, the empire is, is something that is counterposed to chaos, right? Chaos is the breakdown of political order and anarchy. Um, 
So, I, I mean, I, I don't know, and I'm asking you for your opinion. It, you know, do you think that Zoroastrian in some ways then saw that, you know, Persia itself was a way of stopping chaos? If uh, chaos is understood by maybe some revolts, yes, you mean that? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting. You know, Zoroastrianism, even though they were there was a lot of religious tolerance, um, they did have this this religious ideology that was the, that seems to support at least the the important cosmic role and divine role of the Achaemenid Empire. Um, that, that transition that happens where there's uh, uh, less tolerance in the satrapies for, for um, other religions, as, as you mentioned, particularly in Egypt, what do you think caused that, that transition? I don't know exactly, but in many sources, Xerxes uh, represented like a uh, not really wise uh, ruler, but um, vice versa, quite, um, I don't know, brutal, maybe because of this. Yeah, I, I'm wondering in the case of Egypt, for instance, that the priests carried so much political and financial and economic power that when Egypt rebelled from Persia, that, that the priests were the ones who were, were blamed, and, and probably rightfully so. Um, and therefore, maybe was it an aspect of just of, of punishing those who rebelled against them? And, they, and since if the priests were the ones who were fomenting rebellion, that those should be the ones that you want to undermine their, their ability to, you know, to do rebellion in the future by punishing them and, and, and making you know, it, it harder to, to worship uh, the gods that they were representing? When you see intolerance, is it usually associated with people who were in rebellion as a punishment? So could you repeat, please? <laughs> just, just when you see rebellion, um, and, and, or when you see intolerance, is it usually associated as, as retribution for rebellion? But uh, the causes of rebellion wasn't uh, only about um, religious uh, intolerance, but uh, as one of the reasons, yes. Um, <clears throat> I think it depends. Like, I mean, when you look at Darius the first, um, when he, uh, uh, he had like the Ionian revolt. So um, when he was like facing this revolt and he was like, okay, there are like some people who don't want me as king. He tried, for example, through economy um, to actually paint a good picture on him. So he, uh, when he decided to how to make the, the tax system work, he, uh, um, he had this policy of saying, okay, I'm going to ask the satrap to make a, a uh, like to, to calculate how much how much the satrapy could produce and um, they were like giving him a list and he okay this is what they could give you and then he used half of it and just by like of course this was also like a form of Persian propaganda but by opposing that he wanted to like show to the people that he was like a good leader and that people would give the taxes gladly to him because they were okay ah okay the satrap would have even been worse but the persian is kind of like kind so of course later on other leaders have been super oppressive when revolts came into place like either through taxes through intolerance over religion um violence um different modes but um, we still have to distinguish that some leaders also tried a, a different road. Uh, that's, that's really interesting because it, it seems like then you're really starting to see the application of something like Michael Mann's theory, right? Where you have ideology and economics and military all being able to be identified kind of in distinct ways as being ways 
to exert the power of the Achaemenid Empire on, on its subject people. So that, that's really interesting, Melissa, about the economic efforts to, to create solidarity and to, to manipulate people to, to work within the empire. You sadly, he was one of the only ones that was the first who applied such a policy. Because afterwards, there were more like, okay, you refuse to pay taxes, you make a revolt, okay, you're gonna get heavier taxes. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, for I found it also really interesting that Darius was trying to show his kindness to the people, which actually kind of worked. It, it, it kind of worked. Uh, that's interesting. That's very good. Uh, one other question just about the, the nature of the rulership, which really seems to be tied into the failings of the empire, as you just pointed out, that Darius um, did some good things. And of course, you, you know, Cyrus um, and, um, and Cambyses, um, that you have some of these rulers who have really good reputations. It, it, it almost sounds so from what the description is that the length of time that people were actually in power before being murdered or, or ending their rule kept getting shorter and shorter. Um, is there a trend, do you think, that, that the rulers didn't last as long as you, the later on into the empire you get? Just the, the number of years that they actually served as king before things went bad or, or they you know, died in the military or, or poison? Wow. Mm. Coming to collapse, uh, I cannot say that uh, uh, the, the period uh, when uh, the one king was ruling uh, was getting short and shorter. It was true about the last uh, two uh, kings uh, uh, because uh, they were not uh, uh, made truly like uh, the uh, were in power because of uh, the Yenu, uh, Bagoy. However, in the king before them, Artaxis uh, III, um, he, his period uh, uh, of ruling was the longest one in uh, a community empire. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just wondering if that, that the lack of stability in leadership. Um, how about the rate of family members being murdered? You know, because you had to war with the brothers and, um, but at what point does that start to become kind of standard practice in the Persian empire to, to murder off your family so you can be the, the one who survives and, you know, like a, like a reality game show, right? Who's gonna be king? Survivor. Um, we don't have statistics about how many brothers were killed, um, so we cannot give you numbers so exact uh, answer. But as the empire gets older, and particularly as you get into that fourth century um, BC, is, do you think that that's an increasing phenomena that that's happening more and more often? Um, it. I cannot say that it happened more often because I think it was uh, the usual case uh, for rising or and the developing society. I think it happens with all um, uh, societies in some stage, like uh, they are rising and they have a lot, uh, they have heredity, um, the, the power is, uh, uh, given by some, and uh, this uh, because of that occurs uh, some uh, blood fight between brothers. But uh, if we talk about the community empire, uh, we can see that the most crucial one happened closer to collapse. So maybe yes, it was true. Okay. Yeah. Curious. Oh, go ahead. Well, I just want to add that maybe this tendency of revolting is has like a domino effect. And if one revolt happens, then maybe others will eventually happen as well. Well, like like the Arab Spring that we had recently and, and you know, it started in Tunisia and then it spread throughout the Arab countries in North Africa and the Middle East. Um, or maybe, maybe you know, the Black Lives Matter movement that started in America 
is, is now spread to other countries as well, that there's protests in, in England and, and other countries around the world. Um, in England, they just tore down a, a statue of a man who had been a slave trader who had a statue and they threw it in the river. Um, so, so yeah, so I think you're right. There is a domino effect for sure. If people see someone re rebel and they think, hey, that's a good idea. You know what I'm, you know, I, I, we talked the other day, you know, you wake up and think, should I rebel every day? And obviously when you see other people rebelling, you think, hey, maybe that's not a bad idea at all. Uh, we're pretty much out of time at this point. Any last comments from anybody? I uh, just want to say, if you do plan on rebelling, wait till the term's over, finish up your assignments and everything, and then, you know, Sunday you can rebel if you want to rebel. So, all right. Thank you. You guys have a good afternoon. Remember, our last presentation on the Songhai is yeah. Saturday at four o'clock. Comment, somebody. Um, are you still interested? Um, you wanted me to look into the Creek uh, employment of coins. And if that made like a change, um, are you still interested in that? Otherwise, we can talk about it after the the, the session.